Hello everyone, and welcome to Pearson's Speaking About Pedagogy and Practice in English Featured Speakers series. I'm Amy Berger, the Executive Manager for Pearson's Partnership and Professional Development Programs for English Faculty. I'm glad you could join us today, and I hope you'll find the ideas presented by our speakers valuable for your teaching. For those who are new to the webinar format, I have a few quick reminders before the session begins. If you're calling in by phone, please know that this is not a toll-free number. For that reason, we recommend that you select Use Mic and Speakers so you can listen toll-free through your computer. You may notice that your line has been muted. This is to minimize ambient noise as well as interruptions for our speakers. We encourage you to ask questions using the box marked Questions on the right-hand side of your screen. You can pose your questions at any point during the presentation, and when the formal part of the presentation is over, I'll use the remaining time to ask our speakers as many of your questions as possible. Any questions we don't get to will be forwarded, along with your email address, to the speaker directly, so all questions will be answered one way or another. Please include the school or institution with which you're affiliated at the beginning of your question. If you want to keep up with the conversation on Twitter, follow at PearsonNorthAM and use hashtag PearsonLearn. Okay, so that's enough of the preamble. Let's get started. Today's session is Understanding Visual Argument and our speakers are Lester Fagley and Jack Selzer. Lester Fagley holds the Robert Adger Law and Thomas H. Law Professorship in Humanities at the University of Texas at Austin, where he was the founding director of the division, now Department of Rhetoric and Writing, in 1993. Dr. Fagley has published over 40 books and editions, including Fragments of Rationality, which received the MLA Mina P. Shaughnessy Prize, and a number of influential pedagogical texts, including Good Reasons and Good Reasons with Contemporary Arguments, now in their sixth edition, with co-author Jack Selzer. Jack has taught a variety of composition and technical communication courses at Penn State, and he's collaborated with colleagues there and elsewhere in all kinds of ways. In addition to his work with Lester Fagley, his publications include a number of versions of Conversations, reading, Readings for Writing, now edited by Dominic Delicarpini, Rhetorical Bodies with Sharon Crowley, Kenneth Burke in the 1930s with Ann George, and Kenneth Burke in Greenwich Village. The jumping off point for their presentation is the question, can there be an argument without words? Scholars of argument do not believe that everything is an argument, but they do agree that arguments can be mounted through images. But how exactly? How can there be an argument without words when we are accustomed to reading arguments that consist of a clearly articulated claim that is supported by because clauses? And how can readers be confident that they are taking in the argument mounted by a specific image? This webinar is designed to address the many issues that are associated with making and understanding visual arguments and to assist teachers who want to help their students to understand them. Gentlemen, are you ready to get started? We sure are. Let's go. Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lister Fegley, and uh, Jack Seltzer will be uh, joining me today to um, talk about understanding visual arguments. Uh, Jack and I teach courses uh, on argument, and we have for many, many years, but increasingly uh, we have had to think about the role of images uh, in arguments. And so we um, posed these questions that Amy uh, just briefly uh, mentioned, that can there be an argument without words? Uh, scholars of argument um, do not believe everything is an argument, but they do agree that arguments can be mounted through images. But the question is exactly how. Uh, how can there be an argument without words when we are accustomed to reading arguments that consist of uh, clearly articulated claims supported by reasons, and how can readers be confident that they are taking in the argument mounted by a specific image? I mean, how do we know uh, that our interpretation is the one that perhaps was intended? So I'm going to let Jack take over now, and we'll uh, start off by talk, looking at an example. Thanks, Les. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Just as a, a preamble, I want to say, uh, I just want to reinforce what Amy said about uh, how interested we are in your responses this afternoon. We're kind of depending on your active participation 
uh, as much as we can within the constraints of the format. So those of you who are out there, think of yourselves as uh, sitting around a seminar table with us uh, as opposed to listening to Les and I uh, standing in front of you and lecturing. Uh, so give us some active participation. Stay awake as best you can. Uh, we'll be asking for your responses and questions along the way. Uh, so Les, show me the uh, first image here. Uh, it should be up there. Okay. Well, I only have the... Um... Okay. Well, tell me what's up there. The Hofstra University. Okay. Well... Now, uh, Les and I discuss this image. Uh, it's an ad for Hofstra University uh, featuring the uh, young Asian girl. Uh, Les and I discuss this image in our textbooks, and we talk about the argument that this ad makes. It's obviously an, uh, an argument because it's an advertisement, and it's fairly obvious how the image helps to support the good reasons that are articulated in the text of the ad. Um, so in the text, it's hard to read it here, uh, but you can see that we teach success at the bottom. Uh, there are references to hard work, opportunity, and academic opportunity in that uh, text at the bottom of the, of the uh, ad. And the image, of course, supports all of that while contributing um, good reasons having to do with diversity, uh, gender, uh, the arts and humanities dimension that uh, Hoster was hoping to emphasize in this particular ad and uh, also uh, a reach out toward um, what might be called, uh, well, students who have resources, let's put it that way. So it, it uh, makes an appeal to people who can afford to give their kids uh, lessons on the flute. Uh, so the, this image works together with the text. Uh, and other ones, you know, they have captions, titles, and so on. Uh, images often work with text to make an argument. But that's not really what we're talking about today. What happens when there is no text, when there is no caption, when there is no title? How can we understand a visual argument when they are presented without any text? So that's our subject. And now Les will show this first image as our uh, example. Is that so showing what argument? Show? Yeah, it is now, Les. I'm okay. fine. Uh, so you've probably all seen this uh, image at one time or another. What argument is presented by it? This is the kind of thing we're talking about. And I think this argument is pretty easy to, uh, to interpret, uh, maybe because it's well known. But I think the image itself uh, makes a pretty clear appeal. Does it ask us to do something with supporting because clauses? Uh, do something because this mother is uh, having difficulty coping? Because she's wondering what to do next? Uh, because we have children who are apparently too ashamed uh, of their circumstances to even look at the camera? Uh, and because there's this baby in the picture who's uh, clearly in danger, <laughs> let's put it that way. So the photo makes an argument that we should do something. Or it, maybe it makes an argument about, about gender, too. Um, women are in a hopeless predicament, might be the argument here, supported by some of those same because clauses. Uh, so an image like this, I think, makes a clear argument and is uh, pretty easy to interpret. But other times it's not so simple. Now we want to start our um, sort of interactive part by presenting this next image for your consideration. Everybody, what do you make of this image? So we need your feedback now in, uh, in the response box. Um, is this an image that, uh, well, first of all, 
it's an argument. Let's start with that. So it's not just a uh, neutral photo, but it has designs on our attitudes, beliefs, and actions. So what is its argument? Is it an argument that uh, glorifies the woman as reduced to a body? It's an exploitation argument. Is it uh, celebrating the joyful assumption of traditional uh, roles? Uh, does it support a, subvert, a subservient and sexualized role for women? Or alternatively, is this, does this photograph glorify the freedom of the new woman uh, and the powerful possibilities that liberation represents? So does this, does this uh, image celebrate the traditional role or celebrate women's liberation? Is this a picture of a bimbo or someone who is um, fit and sexy and free? So I'm now going to be looking to see if you could all type in uh, your responses here. Tell me what you see and what leads you to what kind of an interpretation. So I'll give you a minute or two and see what pops up here. And Steve, where will people um, respond now? Steve, you out there? Les, do you know where they will? Where are people supposed to uh, uh, post their responses? Uh, it's showing up. I think on... it's in the question box. Yeah. I'm okay, sorry, Les. Go ahead. I... Yeah, I don't see a question box. There we go. Maybe I'm, I still don't see a question box. Oh, now I do. It kind of <laughs> popped up here. Okay. Yeah, the first one comments. Uh, uh, her stance is very strong, kind of superhero stance. And Alyssa, let's see what she says. I see a lot of strength in the image. Refers to the shorts and the boots, which make me think of Wonder Woman. And the pose is very superhero-like. She also looks strong, muscular. Look at those thighs. The image is certainly in contrast to the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue models that we typically see in a beach setting. She's fit and strong looking for sure. And the superhero motif seems to support that as well. But it's hard to get away from the fact that she's not completely dressed. So somebody thinks she's, it's maybe am, ambiguous. Uh, then someone else is calling attention to those fists. Yeah, what are, what's going on with those fists, huh? Is she beating on her chest as a kind of, um, you know, statement of strength? Or is she calling attention to the fact that she's female? Does she want to be a male superhero? Confusing, yeah. I think the fact that we can't even interpret the, um, you know, whether she's beating on the chest or, or hiding herself modestly shows the kind of confusion. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. The beach horizon seems limitless, so it suggests a sense of possibility. Uh, the photo seems to bring these two things into com conflict, absolutely. Uh, freedom and traditional subjugation. To me, it shows how difficult it is to get outside of cultural assumptions about gender, even in discourses of liberation. Yeah, that's a pretty sharp comment. By the same token, how hard it is to see traditional roles as only subjugating. Many young women would see this as liberation, but it's all about the body. Yeah, it's reducing the women to the body again. Sarah says she does seem to be beating on her chest, but she's also hiding the breasts, yeah. 
Um, any other details that you want to call attention to? Her pose? You haven't commented on her uh, swimsuit. Um, is there anything else you want to say about the setting? Uh, what do you make of those red boots? Um, what about the lighting? Any other comments on all this? Says so she's smiling. Says Alyssa. Maybe a little trouble managing the question box. It's very small on my uh, computer, but uh, so I think what's happening here. Well, what about her gaze? Is she looking at us with a proud look on her face? Look at me and my sense of self-assurance, or is her po is, is the look kind of naughty? Is it a uh, look at me kind of image that you might see in uh, in in a bimbo pose? I think students, uh, all of us, have trouble um, interpreting something like this. So what do we do? Well, there, there's the masculine swim sort, sh shorts. So the shorts look masculine. It looks like a male set of bottoms, not a female's. And there's a reference to the short haircut associated with masculinity, masculine possibility. Yeah, and her, her expression is tough to read. Somebody notes there's a storm coming in. What do we make of that? Yeah. yeah. So I think the point here is it's very difficult to interpret images without context. Someone's already mentioned that uh, this, uh, this photo is very different from what you would see in a Sports Illustrated swimsuit um, issue. And that's kind of ironic, because actually this photo did appear in Sports Illustrated on September the 4th, 2002. And Les, is it the next uh, slides that show us some of the context? Yeah, so uh, in response to this photograph, the Sports Illustrated published some um, letters to the editor. One, uh, these, these two interpret this uh, image as uh, an example of exploitation of women. Leave the top toplessness in your swimsuit issue, where the bimbos belong. Put Jenny Thompson, who is the subject of the photo. Jenny Thompson ha happened to be a um, world-class swimmer, an Olympic swimmer. So leave the toplessness in your swimsuit issue, where the bimbos belong. Put Jenny Thompson in the same place of respect that you put other top athletes. And then the second one, after seeing the pose of Jenny Thompson, I turned every page of your magazine. Funny, the male athletes were fully clothed. Not one had his pants off with his hands covering his anatomy. So um, some people are interpreting it for us and helping us to read the image. And there's people who are trying to read it in the other direction too, as the next slide will indicate. So Rick Riley, who often wrote a um, final page article in Sports Illustrated, wrote a final page essay about this particular image. Here's how it begins. Wow, Jenny Thompson has a nice pair, doesn't she? Massive, firm, perfectly shaped. Her thighs, I mean. At least that's what blew me away when I saw the five-time Olympic gold medalist swimmer topless hands over her breasts in Sports Illustrated recently. Killer thighs that could crush anvils. Calves sharp enough to slice a tomato. Biceps that ought to be on a box of baking soda. So why did USA Today columnist Christine Brennan go all Aunt B, complaining that the Thompson picture sends girls the insecure message that an old stereotype still lives and thrives? If you doubt this, look at the picture and notice where your eye goes first, right to her chest. What a load of hypocrites. When Dennis Rodman posed nude, I don't recall Brennan complaining about where women's eyes went then. 
Lance Armstrong, Dan O'Brien, and Ricky Williams have all posed nude. And I don't remember Ms. D. Verona rushing around trying to get them to put on a towel. I don't get this, said Executive Director Donna Lopiano. When you've spent half your life looking down at the line at the bottom of the pool, and you've given up everything, it's incongruent to take that body you work so hard to build and use it for sex. Well, I agree, Ms. Lopiano. You don't get it. Thompson took her clothes off because she spent her whole life looking at the bottom of swimming pools. If she had to miss a lifetime of proms and parties and triple fudge cake, at least she should be able to show the world what she was building in the gym six hours a day. I'm proud of my body, Thompson says, and the wor work it's taken to get it where it is. So, uh, yeah, and then there's, you can read this on your own. It finishes off um, Rick Riley's September 4th, 2000. Yeah, I think I said that this image was in 2002. I guess it was in 2000. Um, now, what are we to make of this? Um, you know, you've already pointed out that you actually don't read this image on its own terms. You actually read it in context. And once this image goes into Sports Illustrated, once we know that Jenny Thompson is an Olympic swimmer, once we throw Wonder Woman into the, into the mix and recall Wonder Woman, we've got all of these contextual cues uh, that guide us to interpret the image. They help us. So even if the image itself doesn't have any text with it, it itself is uh, embroidered into other texts against which we have to read the image. So I think one of the things we're trying to uh, suggest is that these images do not speak on their own terms. Um, that you're always reading text in relation to some kind of context. If Jenny Thompson's photo had appeared in a different kind of magazine, something that doesn't have an 85 percent male readership, it would very likely be read in uh, a more liberatory way. Um, in the end, I think whoever said that this is a very ambiguous uh, image was absolutely right. It's very hard to interpret this thing. It seems to be giving mixed messages. And the mixed messages that surround um, the image in the letters to the editor and the comment by Rick Riley uh, kind of make that point. So the text, the image itself, in the Sports Illustrated context becomes ambiguous, neither liberatory nor confining, but a uh, kind of mixed message. Um, what comes next, Les? In the next, <coughs> okay. okay we have gonna let, I'm, yeah, we're going to throw it back to you here. Okay. Uh, we have two that, photographs uh, from Dorothea Lang um, coming up. Um, this one is on Park Avenue. Um, and it's uh, taken in 1939 uh, with a chauffeur um, uh, holding the door open for a lady getting out of the car, a very well-dressed lady getting out of the car. Uh, and this second photo is um, <coughs> of a man uh, selling social justice. Um, and the caption of this photo was that uh, social justice was sold on nearly every street corner on Park Avenue. So the question is, what um, was Lang up to with these photographs? I mean, she's quite well known for her photographs uh, of the uh, poverty in the Great Depression with the migrant mother photo, photo being the most famous, but she took many others. Uh, so is the, is the message here that the United States is coming out of the Great Depression in 1939, uh, why she took uh, these photos of the prosperity. Well, I think there's a, a clue here. Uh, if you do a little bit of research into this photo, uh, why did she show this uh, photograph of selling social justice? Well, social justice uh, was a 
newspaper that was published by uh, Father Coughlin. Uh, Charles Coughlin was a parish priest in the De Detroit suburbs, but he and he initially was a supporter of, of Franklin Roosevelt, but he uh, quickly soured on Roosevelt, and uh, he had a radio show that w had 30 million listeners, and he was. Um, uh, uh, he he was advocating policies that were similar to what were, were going on in Hitler's Ger Germany uh, and in Mussolini's Italy. So he was uh, sympathetic to Hitler and Mussolini, and there was a strong element of anti-Semitism uh, in his broadcasts too, accusing the uh, Jewish bankers of causing the Great Depression. So this, uh, if you do that research, I think it changes the context here uh, and says something about the. Uh, politics uh, that were going on <coughs> uh, at the end of the 1930s. Jack, do you have uh, thoughts on this? You know, I was just thinking, Les, if we could go back to the first Dorothea Lange photograph. And this photograph we represented as self-contained, so to speak, something that makes an argument on, on its own terms. But actually, as soon as we identify it as a Dorothea Lange 1936 photograph, that contextualizes it for us. It uh, sends us to other discourses that already alert us that this is an argument about um, issues related to the Depression. I indicated that it could be read as an argument about gender, but I think that's an argument that would um, uh, be made in a different kind of context. If we view the photo now, we see it much more about gender than we might have seen it in 1936, when it's clearly an argument about how can we help this desperate woman. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. OK. OK, this is another very famous uh, photograph, the Times Square Kiss, um, that was uh, taken by Alfred Eisenstadt uh, on VJ Day in 1945. Um, it's a, um, a, a controversial image today. I think at the time uh, it represented the kind of uh, release that, that people felt at going through uh, four years of war. Uh, today, it's, uh, I think it's a more ambiguous image. It's a transgressive image, um, and it's, uh, it's kind of unclear um, what the woman is uh, responses to being uh, grabbed and kissed on the street. She's certainly not putting her arm around the guy. Uh, and it's also kind of unclear what he's doing as he's not supporting her uh, with his left hand, um, which he, he could be could be doing. Uh, so it's a uh, it, you know, famous image, but it's uh, one that's been used uh, many times as pose for advertising and for other purposes. Uh, the New Yorker used it in 1996, uh, this was the height of the time of the controversy of gays in the military. And so we have the same pose again, uh, but the transgression here is of a different kind. It, it's uh, one that uh, they were using to make this uh, kind of ironic statement about the controversy over gays in the military. You know, so, Les, I think uh, if I could just butt in here. Sure. In the, in the first image, in a way, you could say that there is a caption to it that tells us how to interpret. You see the war ends comment at the top? I think that tells us that it's a celebration and that we should um, forgive the young man to a certain extent so that the bystanders around are also looking on approvingly. But it, it clues us into the context that this is a wartime photo, that this young man has just been uh, uh, freed of his um, wartime service and, and so on. Then if you go to the second one, it also has a caption supplied by the New Yorker. And in the context of New Yorkerness, it makes a it, it tells us how to interpret things uh, uh, as well. I don't know, what, do, you, do you agree with me? Yeah, I do. I mean, the, the, I think the, the point we're kind of getting at is uh, the one you made earlier, that these images uh, 
for the most part, don't come to us fresh. That they're, uh, you know, we see them through previous images, and uh, clearly, uh, going back to the Lang image, um, you know, anytime you have you know a mom with a baby in her lap, uh, there's always this uh, evocation of of, of, of a Madonna. Uh, so that um, mm -hmm. you know, we we always have those associations uh, when we see it, see an image like that. Okay, let's take a note, look at another image. This is also by Dorothea Lang, and this is uh, we're t taking it out of out of um, out of context, and it did have a caption originally. It was a young mother on camping trip left behind while father went for a hike. Well, that's actually my caption. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is Dorothea Lang's caption. Um, Eighteen-year-old mother from Oklahoma, now a California migrant. Um, the point here, I think, we have uh, both the, the meaning of this, I think, being interpreted any time um, there was a mother without a husband. This was a, a kind of a standard representation of poverty uh, in the uh, 1930s, and, and really going back, their paintings. Um, in the uh, 19th century of poverty that had, had the same, same uh, iconographic convention of the uh, woman with child and no man present. And of course the implication here I think for uh, Lang, uh, who was supporting the New Deal policies, is that uh, if, if the husband provider was not present, it was up, up to the government to step in. Uh, to help out. This is another image. Again, pull pull this one out of context, um, and it's I think out of context. It's kind of an ambiguous image. What what would you say, Jack? Well, I can see what you mean by it being ambiguous because um, the minority body has been damaged and might stand in for, uh, you know, more generally as a statement about uh, what our culture has done to uh, the so-called colored body. Uh, but on the other hand, it's uh, a, re a representation of somebody trying to cope, right? Uh, it's uh, someone with the help of this uh, artificial limb trying to make do. It's a, it's a um, image that uh, celebrates the person who is, um, you know, trying to cope with this difficult circumstance. Is that what you think is going on? Well, uh, again, the, we don't actually when we we got this image or when it was when it was published. Again, it wasn't published uh, uh, alone. It actually was in a context, and it was an ad for um, uh, for Benetton. Um, and it also had this um, food for life um, ad kind of ta tagging along with it. Um, and so anyway, that, this is a kind of a fairly typical uh, Minotaur ad, um, which shows something that's uh, often shocking. They had uh, famous AIDS photographs. They had an exploding car in Northern Ireland, and, and it was kind of in a series. So I think if if you saw this, you saw who, who was publishing this ad, uh, you would know uh, from other ads kind of that this is, this is part of their advertising strategy. Uh, the question is, uh, you know, why do this? Um, does it, uh, is it trying to say that uh, Benetton's a, a caring company, uh, they have a social conscious, um, or is it just simply to get people to look uh, because you cannot not look at this image. Yeah, I would say it's definitely the former, isn't it? Uh, uh, the first, the first image is difficult to interpret, but boy, when you put in the food for life and united colors of Benetton, then it's pretty easy. It's well, let's put it this way: uh, it's much easier to interpret. Mm -hmm. Do any of you have any comments on any of the images that we've seen so far? There is one comment up there. Last, you see it. No, I, I can't see it. Only one of us get, gets the comments. Um, it says, out of context, human objects 
are the extension of human beings. Like the fingernail digging into the skin of an animal becomes a knife. Let's see if there's other comments. I'll call your attention to them as we go on. Okay. Yeah, that's a good observation. Okay, to kind of summarize what we've uh, uh, what we've said up to now is that uh, you can uh, look at first of all, photographs can be arguments, um, and that we can analyze them both by looking closely at the features in the photographs, uh, textual analysis, but we can also try to understand um, how. Uh, this particular image works in a context. So that's both uh, where it's published, uh, who took the photograph, um, what uh, other images it draws on, um, and what, uh, what else we can find, such as the, the social justice uh, that might give us clues to what the argument is in the image. Yeah, so to, to interpret a visual image on its own terms is impossible. You can do textual analysis, something attentive to features within the item, but in order to make a more reliable interpretation, to understand the argument fully, you have to do the contextual analysis. You have to place it in relation to other discourses. You have to see it as a contribution to an ongoing conversation about all kinds of issues. Uh, so you need both of those things to make a reliable interpretation. Okay, we're going to talk about a, a, a particular strategy used in uh, visual arguments, and that is visual metaphor. Uh, this is a PETA uh, ad uh, from 2003. Uh, as you know, PETA has quite a stable of celebrities uh, that uh, do ads for them. And um, they, um, uh, they discovered uh, that when celebrities take their clothes off, this was in their anti-fur campaign, that uh, certainly uh, to do this on the streets of New York City uh, gets, gets a lot of attention. And so uh, they have continued with this particular strategy. Uh, and this one, uh, you know, has this uh, obvious uh, reference to cuts of meat uh, on, uh, 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 this is Tracy Bam um, here. I, I think this is a good place to stop and maybe comment on this photograph, if, if you all out there would do, do that. Uh, what do you think about this PETA strategy? Yeah, I wish we had slowed down on some of the other ones. Uh, it's kind of hard to, in this kind of a format, to anticipate people's responses, but I'm really eager to see what people uh, would say about this one. In a way, it's kind of like the image of the um, Asian girl in the Hofstra University one, in the sense that it's an ad that does have some text uh, that makes uh, a textual and image um, like argument together. Let's see here. It was interesting to see, back on the social justice one Les, it was interesting to see that the headline of social justice was anniversary of the Treaty of Versailles, given the background of the newspaper and the politics it was supporting. Yeah, it was interesting that the newspaper was all about the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, now, this comment is, the straight lines and labels feel very systematized. It's a way of approaching a body that is dehumanizing. So whether the um, ad, uh, ad writers intended it or not, this particular person sees it as very dehumanizing. Uh, a second one says, well, I don't find it persuasive. If anything, it animalizes women. Women are reduced to body only. So rather than um, convincing people to go vegetarian, it's driving uh, people away. It's offending people. 
So here's some who, someone who says, my initial response is that this is totally offensive. I'm not sure why this is my gut reaction, but it is. And then somebody responds, CZ responds and says, it fulfills PETA's shock value requirement, but it's hard not to read it as exploitative to women. So instead of making a comment for um, vegetarianism less, it, uh, it seems to be making an argument to reinforce the sense that women are a bunch of Chuck Rose themselves. It's cutting both ways for some of our uh, participants. Well, it cut, it cut uh, both ways for some yeah. of the viewers of PETA, too. Uh, this is another uh, PETA ad. Uh, this is one of uh, Hugh Hefner's ex-wives, uh, but clearly um, you know, a sexualized message here. And this was a response to it. <clears throat> I want you to consume yeah, pornography <laughs> recruiting now at PETA where only women are treated like me. Yeah, that's kind of the way people were reading the first, uh, the one about the loins. Uh, the sexualization just contributes to the idea that people, namely women, are meat rather than animals are like people, which is what PETA was hoping for. Uh, that's a great observation and sets up this whole thing, this, this pairing of the, uh, uh, you know, the more pornographic one. The first one is being read as pornographic um, by consumers, and so they generate the second uh, parody ad. Yeah, I enjoy um, PETA because there, there's always uh, a lot of opposition to them from different groups, uh, and uh, so we can you know, do a lot of comparison of PETA ads and, and the ads uh, attacking PETA. Mm -hmm. This is another example of visual metaphors. There are quite a few uh, of these anti-smoking uh, ones um, that, are, that are around. Um, of course, the first one has a caption, so it's telling us explicitly yeah. how to interpret it. Mm -hmm. The second one uh, with the cigarette, that's, that's very powerful. Yeah. This is one that, that kind of struck us as, as a quite an, an interesting visual metaphor. So the girl is looking at the magazine uh, article with the beautiful woman and uh, comparing herself with that, huh? Yeah, there are a lot of uh, photoshopped images too that uh, you already um, have you know very thin models, and then to even go even further to to photoshop them um, so that they're even even more uh, slender. Uh, that uh, it it goes to to really pretty pretty extreme uh, lengths uh, in some of the uh, some of the advertising. Uh, this has been a good topic to talk about in class. Uh, students, I've found, uh, you know, have very divided opinions on this. Uh, some think that, that uh, these images are harmful uh, to, um, you know, to girls particularly, uh, uh, and others think that uh, we know enough about advertising that we resist these messages, or we know that they're not they're not real. Um, this I can't, you know. Really pronounce on uh, you know how much uh, they contribute to eating disorders and other other problems. You know, in a way, um, this speaks back to Jenny Thompson, doesn't it? I mean, uh, the question is whether the image of Jenny Thompson was harmful, just as the question here is whether or not these images are harmful the original image of the idealized woman, or this image of the little girl with the scissors. Uh, yeah, they definitely ask for a response. Yeah. The, the responder says, this one reminds me of Marge Percy's uh, Barbie doll poem. I, I love that comment because, you know, you're bringing in another discourse that you're going to read this image against some other kind of image to show that the two arguments are... Um, uh, working together, or 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 against each other, in the way that uh, Jenny Thompson might have been 
seen to be arguing against the swimsuit um, issue of Sports Illustrated, making a counter argument. Uh, but again, the interpretive mood here in uh, reading this particular item in relation to the Marge Percy poem is, uh, you know, making that same point. It's really uh, an excellent thing to do to juxtapose these images to, you know, images that are, are, are other discourses that are around. That's the only way you can make an interpretation. Okay, the other thing we've talked about is cultural knowledge. This is a Dove ad um, that's um, out in their, their campaign uh, to uh, sell their products to men. Um, I want to go, this is one, uh, you know, a bird soaked in oil. And this is pretty easily interpretable because we've seen a lot of images like this. Uh, we know that this is an image of an oil spill. Um, this is one that's um, a, a very typical image for colleges and universities uh, to distribute. Uh, typically, you know, you'll find this on any of their promotional material. Uh, what's interesting about this this image is that it is an eye stock image. So, in other words, uh, they've paid uh, these people are on models, or, or, or at least uh, uh, were paid uh -huh. to, to be in the photograph. Uh, and there have been examples of, of actually photoshopping um, people of color into 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 crowds and, and other in, uh, in college advertising. Yeah, I would say that this would really be a good one for students to talk about in a class. They understand how this has designs on them, and they understand the difference between the image and the reality. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is another image, I, you know, I think it's, it's a, in Afghanistan, uh, of a class uh, being taught in the, in the ruins here, um, <clears throat> that again, uh, you have to have, you know, the cultural knowledge here. I think of what's going on to understand uh, this photograph. This is another one, and I think depends on uh, you know uh, kind of cultural knowledge. Um, this um, uh, girl is putting on makeup uh, to make it seem like uh, she has a black eye and. Uh, and also that she has a bloody lip here. Um, that uh, you know, you have to understand uh, what this this image is doing uh, in trying to uh, examine uh, what happens with uh, spousal abuse uh, to the children. I was thinking it was actually an argument about um, the makeup itself is the equivalent of abuse of women. In other words, the prominence of the um, brush is, is asking you to make a comment on the makeup. Um, again, when you're left with the image, you have to bring it in relation to some other uh, uh, textual, textual um, conversation that's going on. You have to bring the image in relation to something else. Yeah, that's where the cultural knowledge comes from, is other discourses. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting image. Yeah. Do any of you have any comments on this particular one? Well, really, any of them. This is at the point, we're about um, 10 minutes before we stop here. Uh, so um, we'll hand this back to Amy, uh, and we'll have some time for questions here at the end. Great, perfect timing. Well, so we can we can wait for a, a few more minutes um, to see if any any questions uh, roll in, or if there were, were points that um, that someone wanted to make comments they wanted somebody, to make earlier. Somebody is responding to my invitation to comment on the uh, girl with the makeup. Uh, the person says, "I read it as what girls see as being a woman, being grown up. Little girls put on makeup." To feel like their mothers, and this is what many girls see. Yeah, so very interesting um, complication. 
a very textured argument going on here. Yeah, this would be very interesting to uh, bring into a class. Mm -hmm. I hope it's okay, everybody, that we have so many gender-related, um, gender and sexuality-related uh, uh, images here. Of course, the students are very interested in bodily um, mm -hmm. issues, uh, rhetorical bodies, so to speak. Um, So I'm not seeing questions coming into my box, Amy. You know, I see a, a question. I don't know if they're somehow getting divided, but um, no. there's a question here from Michael Walker who asks, um, what do you make of the pearls in the background, if they are pearls? Mm -hmm. Which I think they are. Yeah, well, I'm not always the greatest of interpreters. Uh, yeah, so is this uh, mm -hmm. a little girl who is... Um, social climbing wannabe pearls is what she's got in mind and it puts her uh, makeup effort in relation to social climbing mm -hmm. it becomes a comment about gender in relation to class class aspiration the frustrations mm -hmm. of, uh, of of trying to aspire to something that's, that's very difficult to achieve and of course the whole question of materiality materialism, mm -hmm. rather. Yeah, what do you see there, Amy? Well, you know, I was thinking about that. It's, it definitely, you know, implies a class, um, a class issue. But also kind of, um, you know, when you think of, like, Donna Reed, you always think of the pearls, right? That, you know, Donna Reed in her, in her A-line dress and the, you know, the perfect house and the high-heeled shoes and the, and the pearls that she wears even as she's, you know, making dinner and, and uh, and so it's kind of, in some ways, I guess I think of pearls as indicating an older, um, you know, very much a 1950s um, kind of stereotype of what it means to be a woman having it all, right? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I think yeah, it's a lot of comment we had earlier, Jack, that uh, that uh, little girls, you know, imitate their moms. I interpret these pearls as as, as mom's pearls. Mm -hmm. She's she may well be using mom's makeup. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, so it's the next step in the um, in the disguising, so to speak. Right. Put those and, on. Yeah. And in that way, kind of evoking like this image of sophistication, right? Like this is sort of a rite of passage. That, mm -hmm. that, there's a couple other comments um, I wanna I wanna read, and um, I have a feeling people could um, probably take this conversation in so many ways. Maybe we'll have to. Um, have to have an encore with you guys later on, um, but we probably only have about two more minutes, um, so we can uh, so they can transition for another webinar on this line. So I'm going to read a couple of these just to get them out there, and then I'll also send them to you guys so that um, if you want to be in touch with these folks, you can. So um, Sarah um, Debacher at um, University of New Orleans writes, so can you talk a bit about how you would have your students respond to these visual arguments in assignments, uh, whether visual or written, low stakes, high stakes, whatever? That's a good question. Well, I think, um, you know, in writing classes, a lot of us are trying to, well, we've, we have designs on the way that students think about things. We want them to think rhetorically when they're producing. They generate their arguments in relation to other arguments. Uh, they're not decontextualized things. There's not things that they just go up in their uh, dorm rooms and write, but they're interventions into culture. And uh, mm -hmm. so we typically, I, I typically do a lot of rhetorical analysis assignments like this. Find an image and tell us uh, what to make of it. A common, um, a common assignment is to uh, interpret an ad, but you know it's obvious what an ad is trying to do. Uh, that is still a good assignment, though, because exactly what the ad is trying to fight against and how it's trying to make its argument is often quite intricate. Uh, mm -hmm. But you can, you know, as Lester's um, slides here indicate, there's a there's great room for an analysis of all kinds of images, whether they're ads or photographs or uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. Got another question there? You know what we do, but um, but we are 
out of time. We had this scheduled till just till 3:50, so I know that um, that there's some other folks that need to get on here to start prepping. What I think I'm going to do is um, I'm going to see if we can pull the list of everyone who attended and their um, their email, the email address they used when they registered, and I'll um, I'll round up these additional comments, which are very interesting. There's some great um, questions here, and also some great suggestions about other images and readings. Um, so I mean, this is this is really this is great. A lot of interaction here. So I'll put you um, put you guys all on a little email together and send out those comments so that you can see um, and learn from each other um, as Terrific. we've been learning from this, and maybe. Um, you guys can correspond. I'm also going to post this on um, pedagogy and practice. I'll, I'll post the recorded webinar and the slides. And um, that site, you know, is open access. Um, and but people can also post comments there um, or send in their own assignments if they want to um, really build on that. So I'll include the link to that um, in the email, and, uh, and maybe we can um, build a little exhibit there on, in the Pedagogy and Practice Gallery and, uh, and share resources together. So, Very good, Amy. Thanks for thank guiding you us guys. through this. And, this uh, was awesome. This was, this was great. I always, I always love to hear you guys present, but um, this, this really generated a lot of conversation and um, that's so hard to do on a webinar, so um, I applaud you as always. <laughs> thanks to the participants for their participation. Bye, yes, everybody. thank you. Bye, everybody. Hope to see you next week. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye, guys.